everyone. My name is Sherwood Smith. I use he, him pronouns, and I have the pleasure of presenting with a friend and colleague, Dr. Nikki Kana. This is a second part in our series of what is race? You can't be anti-racist if you don't understand race. And this session will focus on multiracial identity, posing the question that is sometimes asked of people, what are you? This session is a continuation of the work of the Vice President's Office for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which started out with Amazing Grace, Finding Answers Together, and Beyond Brave Spaces. It's an attempt to encourage thoughtful, inclusive dialogue, and also spark our own motivation to explore and learn about these topics ourselves. This will be about 30 minutes. We encourage you to watch this. It will be followed on November 13th by an opportunity for all of you to post questions to us, and we will be sitting there sort of as respondents to all the questions we get to the best of our ability. I want to take a moment to do a land recognition. The University of Vermont is located on land which has long served as a site for meetings and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and is specifically home to the Western Abenaki. UVM honors and recognizes and respects these peoples, especially the Abenaki, as the traditional stewards of the land and waters on which we are gathered today, both in reality and virtually. And in that spirit today, by acknowledging that we are guests here in this land, we also want to acknowledge that we must respect and protect the land within our use. And in offering this land acknowledgement, UVM affirms the needs and sovereignty of indigenous people, their histories, their experience, and our important role in continuing to recognize their historic presence here. So thank you. I've mentioned that this is a collaboration, told you a little bit about the background. We will now take turns. I'm going to drop out now. I'm going to ask Nikki to introduce herself, and then um, Nikki will start. We've each been asked to come up with three or four points we think are most salient around this issue of multiracial identity. Nikki, All right. you, please. Fantastic. Thank you, Sherwood. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm an associate professor in the sociology department at UVM, and I've been at UVM since about 2007. And uh, most of the courses I teach in that department have to do with race relations, and my research is also centered on topics of um, race uh, and identity in particular. Um, so Sherwood asked me to come up with uh, several topics or points that I would like to um, talk about today with regard to this broader topic of what are you. Um, and I think the first thing I want to say is um, in my classes, when I teach about race relations, I always start with the first point, which is race as biological is a myth. And uh, many Americans think about race as, as um, being something concrete, something sort of unquestioned for them. Um, you have a particular way you identify, and we might think about racial categories as being between maybe five, six, seven different categories of, you know, maybe like we might think of them as subcategories of the human race, but regardless of our so-called racial classifications, we're almost genetically identical to each other. Um, we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA with each other. And usually my students are pretty shocked when I talk about this. So if we compare ourselves to other species, for example, chimpanzees actually show three times the amount of variation as compared to humans and fruit flies 10 times the amount. So certainly very interesting. And this picture here that Sherwood has put up are three pictures of three sets of fraternal twins and obviously looking at them, um, one child to the other within the same set, um, they look very different from each other. And I really like these pictures and these examples because they illustrate to us that even though we look or can potentially look very different from each other, 
we are genetically very similar. So these girls, um, each set share the same mother and same father, but they obviously look very different. Um, they're likely going to be treated very differently in their lives, um, but genetically speaking, they're not really different at all. Um, sure, would you could probably go on to the next slide even, unless you want to add something here. Um, you know, most human genetic variation also has nothing to do with race. Um, and probably go back one slide. Yeah, so that one. So most human genetic variation, there is some genetic variation from one human to the next, but it has very little to do with this thing we call race. And this is a really good example of this on this slide. So these are three scientists who are working on um, um, DNA and, and decoding the human genome. And they actually compared their DNA sequences with each other. And if you look at them, you can see James Watton and Craig, Craig Venter um, on the outer edges here. Both would be classified probably as white and Kim in the middle as Asian. And in fact, what they found was Venter and Kim, both on the right hand side, actually had more genetically in common than the two white men had. And so this is a really good example. And we think about people of different racial groups, we might assume that we have a lot of genetic differences with them, but even sure would you and I, we might have more in common with each other genetically than um, I may have with people of my own so-called racial group. And, and I think that's really important to point out. Um, we could probably go on to the next slide. And, you know, when we think about genes, there are no genes that are unique to any particular racial group. And even when we think about physical characteristics, we oftentimes have stereotypes for how different racial groups look and stereotypes about their physicality. So their eye shape or their skin color or their nose shape, for example. But in fact, we see these, tra these traits actually oftentimes transcend racial groups. So dark skin, we might associate with people of African ancestry, but people with dark skin also exist in India, in South America, uh, among Aboriginal Australians and many other groups as well. And even the epicanthic eye fold, where we might associate that with East Asians, we can also find that among indigenous groups in North and South America, um, among some Eastern European groups, and even among some groups in Africa. And this is just a good example of that. So these are just some things I like to share with my students to have them sort, sort of start breaking down this idea or this myth of race as something biological. And I'll turn it over to you, or I can keep going. You want me to go on to my next point? Okay. Yes. <laughs> So my next point was that all racial categories or our racial categories aren't as straightforward as we oftentimes think they are. Um, there's a really great article I read years ago and um, it was in the New York Times and it was titled You're Smart If You Know What Race You Are. And what the author of that article was trying to say was not that you're smart because you know you're white or black or Asian, right? But that our racial categories are a lot more complex than we think they are. And this is a really good example. So on this particular slide, you can see the current federal classifications um, that are currently used, for example, on the census. So if you just filled out a census this year, you would have seen these categories. And this is how the government currently defines them. So if you look at white, a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East or North Africa. And here you can see when we think about the way this is defined, it sort of defies our everyday ways in which we might socially construct race. So people from the Middle East or North Africa are very likely not having the same life experience as European Americans um, who are also classified as white. If we look at some of these other categories as well, for example, Asian, a person having origins in the original peoples of, and you can see the Far East, Southeast Asia, or, or the Indian subcontinent, and you can see a bunch of different examples here. Well, here we see all these different diverse groups, diverse in terms of culture, but also in terms of physicality, which is really important because in our society, we oftentimes link certain physical characteristics to race. You can see the people look very different. So somebody from India is gonna look very different than somebody from Japan or somebody from Korea, from somebody from Pakistan, but we're sort of just shoving them all into this category that we call Asian. Um, so there are a number of different examples of the ways in which our categories may not completely make sense. And just one last example I'll point out is 
um, American Indian or Alaska Native, those actually used to be separate categories and then they were merged together. Um, but also that's separate from Native Hawaiian and very likely Native Hawaiian people and um, indigenous people in North and South America actually do share some ancestry or some um, more recent common ancestors. Um, so the main point is that these categories aren't as straightforward as we might think they are. Thank you, Nikki. So following up with what Nikki just said, I'm going to ask you to do something on your own. I want you to think about these three terms, nationality, race, and ethnicity. And I want to see if you can, in your own mind, come up with your own definitions for those terms. Take a moment and do that. Once you have those definitions, I want to challenge you to see if you can define those terms without using similar terms in the definitions. So if you use skin color in one, can you avoid using it in the other? If you use culture in one, can you avoid using it in the other? So that you have three distinct terms here. If you're having trouble with this, that's okay. But I think it's really important we think about how we use language and what we mean by the terms. As Nikki pointed out, they are all social constructions, but they're social constructions that have important meanings. And as we talk about people who are multiracial, we're often talking about people who have multinational and multi-ethnic identities as well as racial. So I wanted to give us a moment to sort of come to at least a personal understanding of how we think about and use those terms. So I'm going to get personal. Um, as I said, Shrewd Smith, he, him pronouns. I identify as African-American or black. I grew up in New Jersey. Um, I'm a cisgendered, older male identified person. And my family history really is centered in New Jersey. My grandfather and my great grandfather are from there. And then if we go back a little farther, Spark Hill, which is just north. So my grandfather, who passed away back in the late 70s, and when someone dies, you have to go through all their records. And we were starting to go through his records. And I want to point out an interesting fact. His birth certificate says Negro. His marriage certificate said white. And his death certificate said black. All right. Um, and yes, my grandmother's birth certificate birth and death certificates also said black. Um, and we never did see her marriage certificate, so I don't know what they marked for my grandmother, right? I also want to point out that if you talk to my aunts, they would say that they were Negro, that black was a color, and they were not a color. I went through a transition when Afro-American was the popular term. I spent time in the Peace Corps, and if I said I was African-American, anybody in Tanzania or Kenya where I was working would have said, well, where are you from in Africa, right? Because there the definition was nationality. They were Kenyan or Tanzanian. And then their definition was tribal. Um, there are 42 different ethnic groups within Kenya and 120 in Tanzania. And that leaves out all of the intermarriage that goes on and all of the mixing. So lots of multi-ethnic pieces there. So I just give you my own story and I have no idea because my grandfather has passed away how in the world his birth certificate ended up with white on it. Um, but even in the course of his lifetime, those things changed. And I will be clear that at least in the oral history of my family, we have Iroquois, Cherokee, Pennsylvania Dutch Quaker, and people of African descent in our background though I would say visually people are going to always identify me as African-American or black, and that's how I identify myself. I'm going to give it back to you, Nikki. Yeah, I think hearing your personal story is really interesting, and it just made me think about um, 
my own situation where people will ask me about my racial background or ask me about my background. And I think as a child, I confused all of those concepts that you talked about. Sometimes I would say I was white and Indian or American and Indian. My father's from India. Um, so I think for me, ethnicity, race, and um, you know, all these categories sort of got mixed up together. And so it probably would have been very difficult and maybe even today for me to parse out. Um, even when I think about saying to people, one of the common things I used to say when I was really young was I'm, I'm half white and I'm half Indian. And obviously there's no such thing as half and half, but that's how I imagined it. And, and this is something I do say to my students as well when I think about this, this the ways we oftentimes think about race as, as quantifiable as I'm half this or I'm a quarter this. Um, and, and I really thought that there were these biological differences between these two groups. And my, my mother and father, even though they are raced differently and they come from different places, um, they're genetically really not different. I mean, they have genes that code for different things. Like my dad's got dark hair, my mom has blonde hair, and my mom has light skin, and my father has darker skin. But beyond that, we're just talking about really superficial differences. This next slide is, is just really, hoping you know my hope here is to prod people to think about those american categories that i showed you and think about how um there are many groups that don't necessarily fit easily into those classification schemes so we all might have ideas of how many races there are and we sort of think of them as comprehensive but if we start to look around the world at the diversity we see in terms of culture and physical appearance and so on and so forth we see a lot of groups just don't fit so neatly into these categories um, the first example here, are Sicilians white or something else? If you go to Sicily, you'll see people with dark skin, the same in Portugal, the same in Spain, but they're classified as white or European. Um, uh, you know, it sort of shows how maybe our categories are a little more complex than we think they are. Um, the second picture, uh, why are Egyptians counted as white and not as black or African given they're from Africa? We sort of make these distinctions in our federal classifications that don't always make a lot of sense when we really sit down and start to think about these, these classifications. And I would say that, you know, people from Egypt, their everyday experience uh, in the United States is probably different than that of a European American, um, especially if they have darker skin. Uh, Pol Polynesians are a good example. Aboriginal Australians are another good example. Um, uh, people who are Aboriginal in Australia have dark skin. They can also have blonde hair. Um, are they counted as black? Are they white? Are they, are they something else? And so I would challenge people to think about the categories um, uh, that they typically consider when they think of race and, and think about the sort of diversity around the world and, and are they really comprehensive categories in the way that, that maybe they were taught they were. Um, in fact, my hope is that they will see that uh, everything's a lot more complex and convoluted than, than they might have thought. Um, OK, so this one is a really good example, too. So when we think about race as not being so clear cut, um, those current federal classifications I showed you are the current ones and they've changed over time. Um, our American courts have also been in the business of defining race and I've written here and their rulings reveal that race also isn't so straightforward. So Indians are a really good example. Um, Today, they're currently classified as Asian, but you can see over time, depending upon the year, courts ruled Indians um, to be you know, raced in different ways. So in 1909, you can see the court said Indians are probably not white. They weren't really sure. A year later, they're like, okay, well, Indians are white. Uh, seven years later, okay, wait, they're not white. And then you can see you know, this sort of back and forth until 1923 when the Supreme Court of the United States ruled, in fact, they're not white. Um, at the same time, the courts ruled they weren't white. The census still counted them as white for 30 years after this. Um, and I always like to use the example of, of my father here who, you know, he's currently classified as Asian or Asian American. He never thought of himself that way until he came to the United States. He saw himself as Indian. And we can make an argument that Indians are also one of these groups that maybe don't fit so neatly into these current classifications. Um, and I think he still struggles with seeing himself as Asian American because to him, Asian or Asian American, he oftentimes thinks of the stereotype of East Asians, um, which is an uncommon. Uh, but Indians aren't the only group. So I've, I've got a little statistic here, which is between 1878 up until 1952, there were 52 different court cases with regard to race where people went before the courts 
um, either challenging or asking to be classified a certain way. Um, and these court cases were de basically deciding who was white and who wasn't. And and uh, these were always white men who were on the benches who were making these decisions. So again, you know, race is uh, very convoluted. And I don't know. Oh, I don't know if you want me to go on to my next. Okay, so I'll go. <laughs> I'll go on to my next point. So, um, and I don't know, Sherwood, if there's anything you want to add at this point before I go on. Are you good or? Sure, I would add. Your Sicilian example is wonderful because there was a case in 1919, um, Rollins versus Alabama. Yeah. It was a case of anti-misogynation, which said that black men couldn't marry white women. And the lower court had ruled this black man was guilty of marrying a, a white woman. But the Alabama Supreme Court threw out the case. And in if you look up the court, because the court verdicts are all recorded, they said there is no clear evidence the woman being Sicilian is white. And they didn't say she yeah. was white. Yeah. They said there was no clear evidence that this woman was white. And as Nikki is pointing out, the courts not only had people debating whether or not, you know, are Indians white, are Japanese white, are Syrians white, but they also had all of these cases in which is someone who's one quarter German, one quarter Chinese, and one quarter Lebanese white, right? So the courts not only had to decide, quote, are people of two obviously different races white, but they also were struggling with the question of people who are multiracial, what does the court decide where they fit? And again, the court was all white men, or as I love Tallahassee Coates, people who thought they were white, right? Yeah, I like that, yes. <laughs> Um, you know, and this not just in the U.S. as well. I mean, I think our examples are certainly centered on the U.S. because uh, for me, that's that's the context I study, and obviously that's the context in which I live. But I also like to talk about contexts outside the U.S. where, um, for example, in South Africa during the apartheid era, there were um, courts also deciding race, but also what were called racial classification boards. So if you were ambiguous in some way with regard to your race or it wasn't known what your ancestry was, um, you would go before a racial classification board and it was always white men in this situation too. They would make a determination of what your race was and it was oftentimes very arbitrary uh, ways in which they made that decision. They might hold a paper bag next to your face to see if you were lighter or darker than the paper bag or ask you to put a pencil in your hair. And if the pencil fell out of your hair when you moved your head, then you would likely get a white or Indian classification. So, you know, we see this sort of ways in which um, uh, the courts or these classification boards had this sort of determination and power over people's racial classification. And South Africa is a really interesting example. There's a great book called When She Was White about um, a woman by the name of Sandra Lang, who was reclassified three different times during the apartheid era. And she doesn't even hold the record for the number of reclassifications. There's another man by the name of Vic Wilkerson who was reclassified five times over his lifetime. So it you know, should show us how absurd this concept of race um, can be. Um, and we can see this certainly outside the US in places like South Africa as well. So should I go on to point three? Yes, please go ahead okay. and then I'll follow you up. OK, sounds good. So point three I have here is that this concept of race and even the categories that we use to classify each other differ around the world. So um, how we might think about race in the US may look very different and in fact is very different in other parts of the world. So one example is blackness. Uh, blackness itself, the way we think about blackness varies around the world. So in the US, we typically think about blackness as based on um, having African ancestry. Um, in the United Kingdom, blackness traditionally is referred to a sort of in similar ways, people with African ancestry, but also Indians, Pakistanis, and, and other people of color, particularly if they had dark skin. Um, I remember being young and visiting family in England and being surprised when um, somebody had called my father a black man and I was thinking he's not black, he's Indian. But that was the different conception um, and that's a really good example. Um, I've got here a quote by actress um, Lupita Nyong'o 
who is of Kenyan ancestry. I believe she was born in Mexico City, but raised most of her life also in Kenya. And she said, having come to the United States, it was the first time that I really had to consider myself being black. And and this quote makes me think about many of my family members who have said, you know, they didn't really think of themselves as Asian or Asian American until they left India and came to the United States. So the ways in which we think about our categories um, are also very different from one society to the next. And maybe I'll turn it over to you, Sherwood, and give you a Thank chance you. to jump in like. So following up on exactly what you said, there's this piece about how we think of race ourselves, which you've named really well, and there's this piece of how we are named. Mm. And I think yeah. that one of the challenges when we think of people who either self-identify as multiracial or are identified as multiracial is that ability to self-name, that ability to self-define. And I think that that is where, for me, you know, the institutional structures, you know, the choice of being both is a relatively new construct in terms of people being able to self-identify. Certainly in my African-American community, it was quite clear that people had mixed backgrounds, but it was also quite clear that it was meaningless if the outer society did not identify you as white or black, right? So some people did pass. Um, it was odd, my grandfather wasn't passing, but we certainly had members of my family I heard about who were able to pass as white, but it meant that they had to disassociate themselves with anything that would have connected them with the black communities. So they were multi-ethnic, but that wasn't a viable category for them to, to use. We see in the US that at least for African-Americans, you had the one eighth rule, the one sixteenth rule, the one drop rule. So there's sort of an essentializing that if there's any black in you, you're completely black, right? And so it wasn't viable for certain people to claim to be multi-ethnic or multi-racial, that the courts, the police, the larger community councils, city governments, housing restrictions, defined who you were, even if you were mixed. The most interesting case for me is our past President Obama. You could basically, if you look at his parentage, it's clear that he's multi-racial. Yes, race is a construct, but, and literally interestingly enough, also his father came from Kenya, right? Um, but I can't imagine what it would have been like if he had attempted to run as a white man, right? And yeah. even running as a, you know, he was open about his background, but I did not hear a conversation about him being multi-ethnic or multi-racial as a part of the larger conversation. Certainly it was brought up and it was discussed, but I still think that there are challenges in the U.S structurally for having useful conversations about this identity, though I do think people have taken on the ownership of it, and certainly it's much more accepted now than when I was much younger. So I just want to follow up on the point you made that there's there's that individual challenge of how do I identify, but people coming into the U.S. are suddenly finding that they're being categorized by the society and may or may not have much choice about that. Yeah, that's that's such a good point. That's that's a really good point. Um, and it probably takes us into the next slide, which is point four. Um, unless you want to if you want to go ahead and talk about this as well. I'll just follow up and say that given what I said, I really feel that race is a construct around power and privilege. Um, this is taken from a book by Gould called Mismeasure of Man. And just reinforcing that as we've both talked about, Racial identities take on institutional structures. They reference cultural pieces. People are often labeled by how they dress, the foods they eat in relationship to the dominant culture. We're often categorized by who we associate with, whether that's because we live in a particular neighborhood or what our friendship and family networks are. And to a certain extent, race has been a sort of proctor for social class. And that often, whether it's indigenous, African-American, Latinx, we had still Chinatowns, that economic class was also another proctor for questioning or labeling people racially. 
And to just follow up, to give you a concrete example of this, during World War II, it suddenly became critical for the US to tell the difference between the Japanese and the Chinese. Now, the first assumption is that there's no racial mixing between these groups, and there's no racial mixing between these two groups and any other racial groups, so that they can make a distinction between Chinese and Japanese as two purely different groups. And this is just an example of a chart that was put out to try to help immigration and other people distinguish between these groups. And again, it goes back to this weird dichotomy of saying they're one or the other, and there's no possible variation both within the populations or that those populations aren't mixing and people that are coming in aren't more than one ethnic identity when they arrive. Back to yeah, you, Hewitt. That's, that's such a good point. So I think the last point here relates to some of the things you already said, particularly about Barack Obama and his ability to, if he had wanted to run as a white man, I think that there certainly would have been a lot of pushback um, to that because of American conceptions, uh, the way we think about race. So the point four is race is a social construct and um, our race is constrained by society. So society creates this concept of race. It creates the categories. We do this in groups and, and as part of our society, but we're also constrained by it. So uh, Rachel Dolezal is a good example. Some of our viewers might remember this story from a couple of years ago. She was born a quote unquote white woman, um, but presented herself as black and identified um, publicly as an African-American woman. Um, and she received a lot of backlash or pushback when her parents, I'll say, quote unquote, outed her. Um, and, and here you can see a picture of her on the left as a child and a picture of her on the right where she has obviously darkened her skin. She's she's manipulated her hair in a way to appear as a black woman. Um, and then when confronted with um, this this sort of what people felt like was a ruse of her identifying herself as African-American, she said, well, race is a social construct sort of Know, sort of giving this answer that because it's a social construct, I should be able to identify however. But certainly we're constrained by society. So in American society, race is very much tied to, in our minds, ancestry um, and how you look. And she's trying to take care of the how you look part, as you can see here with the right hand picture, but the ancestry piece doesn't necessarily fit. So we're certainly constrained by society. And I'll, I'll say, though, you know, race, as, as I've said before, differs in different societies. So not all societies put so much emphasis on ancestry as we do in the U.S. So places like Brazil, these these um, racial categories are oftentimes tied to literal skin color. So, you know, the way we think about race in the U.S. can still look different from other societies. But in the there was a lot of pushback against Rachel Dolezal identifying as a, as a black woman. And it certainly was a very interesting story. Definitely a very complex piece. And it it raises this, you know, larger question, I think, in terms of Rachel Dolezal is one of the few cases in which somebody passed for a non-dominant identity intentionally. And that's also another piece is most passing is an attempt to pass in to the higher status position. Um, I think that that's an interesting question about passing in terms of identity, in terms of the Dolezal case. But it does point out if race was not a social construct, how can someone pass? Right? right. You shouldn't be able to sort of personally just change your appearances so that you could actually be of a different racial group if race was this clear cut, easily identifiable thing. And I think the, the last piece for me is this real idea of this inability to be more than one thing. And the, there's a case from Mexico that I want to point out to people. And the book is called The Great Arizona Orphan Abduction, where the Irish orphans from New York were unacceptable as adoptees in the Northeast because the Irish were questionably white and Catholic. They were totally abducted adoptable in Arizona by Mexicans and many Mexicans by their own admission, um, Mexican-Americans are multi-ethnic. 
mixture of Spanish and indigenous and African ancestry, among other things, right? So they, priests and nuns, pack them up, take them down to Arizona and give these Irish kids to Mexican-American families. The white people in the community are appalled that brown people are adopting white children and kidnap them. And the courts actually rule in the favor of the kidnappers. And so the priests and nuns have to take them back to the Northeast because the courts won't allow them to be adopted. And going back to Nikki's earlier point, it may well be that they were more closely genetically linked to the Mexican families they were given to than they were to the white families who kidnapped them. So there's this continuing issue of this inability to accept or um, throughout our history, acknowledge the complexity of identity in ways that really had very negative effects for people throughout our history. I want to give us some resources, but I want to give it back to Nikki for a minute to see if um, there are any closing points you want to make before I sort of close this out with a few resources and thank everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think the the main thing I would challenge viewers to think about is to question the ways that they've thought about race. Um, I know that for many of my students, they come into my classes thinking about race as biological. Um, uh, thinking about race in a very specific way as if it's this concrete reality out in the world for them to discover and perhaps if the categories don't fit perfect they they sort of have this notion that it's just a matter of figuring out what those categories are but I would challenge people to really think about um, the categories they use and what they actually mean and to think about all the different ways in which we sort of have conflicting ideas about race um, and think not just in the United States, but you know, what does it look like in other parts of the world? And even in the United States, how has it changed over time? I think these are really fascinating things to think about. And um, so I'm interested to see what sources you have, Sherwood, to share. Thank you, Nikki. And I would just reaffirm that once you get outside the U.S. borders, things get even more complex. And if you think things are rigidly fixed in any sort of way, going international will really challenge that ability to hold things as concrete and written in stone. Um, That's such a good point. So these are just two sites. I picked the second one because it really fitted well to the title that um, was suggested for this in terms of what do we call people? And then I wanted to share, oops, I'll fix this, um, two books with you, and five books with you actually. Um, Lopez, White by Law, which both of us referenced, will show you all of these court cases as the courts struggled to sort of define race. And courts were given the power to define race and as a byproduct of that citizenship in the US. Um, Multiracial identity has really been talked about in a lot of different ways. And I think the one book, Half and Half, is an excellent read. And the other is a much more of a counseling take. Um, Maria Root really looks at multicultural experiences as a counselor and talks about those experiences, her own and others. And then I will fix this slide. Hidden behind it um, is an excellent book in terms of um, what does it really mean to be white and um, how is whiteness defined? So just some quick resources for you. And I want to end with reminding us that there will be a time for us to all be together again and really encourage you to come with good questions. We both would enjoy some hard questions, I think. And we'll be really honest if we don't know answers, but we would really enjoy having some really good questions put forward. So if you'll join us on November 13th from one to two, there'll be a live Teams event where you'll have a chance in the chat to put in questions and hear what other people ask, what they think through the chat, and also we'll do our best to share our thoughts and honestly and openly with you as we can. So thank you again. For Thank you, yes, Nikki, thank you. so much for giving of your time and energy around this topic. Thank you, Sherwood. Sure